Jerusalem. Partial funding for this program is provided by the Stratford Foundation. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The deal was struck 60 years ago. America struck a pact with Saudi Arabia. You gave us oil and we will give you protection. Every president since has reaffirmed the arrangement. Over the years, both sides have benefited. Billions of petrodollars were recycled to buy expensive American military hardware. When necessary, America has intervened directly to keep the kingdom safe. They found the oil for us, and they've been our friends ever since. But there's always been another Saudi Arabia. One of fervent Muslim warriors, tribesmen with an innate distrust of outsiders. For them, the monarchy is corrupt, and the deal with America, a bargain with the devil. Saudi preachers ascend their pulpits to rail against infidels and Jews. Saudi citizens have supplied millions of dollars to school and train jihadis around the world. Oh my God, there it goes! When it became clear that 15 of the 19 were Saudis, that was a disaster. Now, Saudi militants have turned their sights on targets inside the kingdom and on Americans in Iraq. President Bush maintains that the Saudis are America's friends. Tonight, a special frontline history, House of Saud, the story of a troubled alliance. Yamama Palace in Riyadh, Saudi officials gather for a royal majlis. It's largely ceremonial, but speaks volumes about how this country is governed. It is presided over by the kingdom's de facto ruler, Crown Prince Abdullah bin Abdulaziz, a son of the kingdom's founder. one side of the crown prince sit leading Wahhabi clerics, guardians of tradition who habitually resist change. On the crown prince's other side are the royal family and its retainers. Presumably, the two groups are partners in power. As male subjects come forward asking for favors, a new well for a village, or money for a daughter's wedding. They are participating in the modern incarnation of an ancient tribal custom. They are also here to enhance the royal family's image, to present the ruler to outsiders like us as benevolent and wise. This is government by patronage. There is no bill of rights here. Whatever the prince says or does, 
the tribal chiefs express gratitude and pledge loyalty. Afterwards, they all gather to pray. The Al Saud family conquered the kingdom in the name of God and the Quran. Do you expect this to ever become a representative democracy? I believe that Saudi Arabia, in a sense, is a democracy as it is. Resistance to change is a matter of survival here. This is a nation in shock, where tradition and modernity are in violent collision. Few places on earth have come so far, so fast, as Saudi Arabia in the 20th century. ago, the Arabian Peninsula was a place of warring tribes. Nomads, sheikhs, emirs. Among them was the family of Al Saud. At that time, the Saudi Arabian kingdom consisted of tribes and small fiefdoms. There was no unity amongst these warring groups. The Saudi Arabian Kingdom was never united the way it is today until the reign of King Abdul Aziz. In 1902, with just 60 men at his side, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud rode out to begin his quest for a kingdom. He certainly had a vision. He had a large big vision of what he wanted this country to be. He wanted it to be a nation and to take its place among the nations rather than to be a forgotten backwater where nobody cares what they live or die or what's happening there, but to be a player in the international scene. But to conquer the whole Arabian Peninsula, he needed the fighting skills of the nomadic Bedouins known as the Ikhwan. The Ikhwan, or Muslim brothers, were renowned warriors, light and mobile, and extremely courageous. They were also fervent Wahhabi Islamic Puritans. To recruit them, Abdul Aziz had to commit the family to spreading their fundamentalist version of Islam. The Ikhwan were an important fighting force that supported the expansion of Ibn Saud. They had this vision that they propagated true Islam in its purest form. So anything they encountered that differed from that vision was regarded as objectionable. The nature of where they were coming from, the desert, uh, was isolated really for almost 800 years. In the desert you have either uh, day or night, you have uh, cold or hot. You don't have these shades. Even the music is only one string. And that has kind of polarized the, the way of thinking. It's either black or white. Uh, it's either you're with me or against me. The first Western reference we have to the Ikhwan, the Brotherhood, comes from Captain Shakespeare, who was one of the early British explorers in Arabia. And he'd already heard that these people were fiercely anti-Western. Right from the beginning, this cutting edge of Saudi power was, was mistrustful of the West and lethally mistrustful. For them to, to kill a foreigner uh, might well guarantee their place in, in heaven. With the Iqwan troops, Abdul Aziz captured province after province of the vast desert. By 1926, he and the Iqwan had captured the jewels of Arabia, Mecca and Medina. 
making Abdulaziz the ruler of Islam's holy shrines. It brought prestige and substantial income from visiting pilgrims. It was also a great victory for the Wahhabis. The Wahhabis took their name from an 18th century Islamic preacher, Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Wahhab was first to see the value in forging an alliance with the able tribesmen of the Al Saud family in order to help spread his austere version of Islam. The Ikhwan were living out Wahhab's dream, and they wanted to keep going. They wanted more, and they just wanted to go on and on um, and attack particularly the, the British settlements in the north and Transjordan and so on. They wanted to create an empire extending across all of the Muslim Ummah. They would have, God knows where they would have stopped, maybe in France, <laughs> given the chance. So when Ibn Saud tried to restrain them and ask them not to launch attacks into these territories, they rebelled. They revolted against him and they accused him of being uh, an infidel, of having abandoned the uh, faith of Islam and becoming worldly and uh, all that kind of thing. They said, why Ibn Saud sent his kids or ch children or, or sons abroad to London to this is against Islam? Why we had the new technology coming, wireless station, whatever, this is against Islam. If Abdulaziz were to stay in power, he had to destroy the Ikhwan. But how could he, the defender of Islam, justify going to war against his Muslim fighters? His way out was to win over the religious establishment, the ulama, who were regarded as the moral guardians of the realm. He turned to the religious establishment in Riyadh. He said, you judge this. Judge between me and the Ikhwan. So they looked into the Islamic laws. They scrutinized the Holy Quran and the Hadith and found that King Abdulaziz was right. So they gave the famous fatwa, which said that the Ikhwan were wrong. They had no right under Islamic law to rebel against the ruler. So from that moment, they actually changed their role, the ulama, and they became uh, almost uh, like a force to be used to sanction politics. And that was the crucial moment in 1927. With the ulama's consent, Abdulaziz crushed the Ikhwan. The path was now clear. In 1932, Abdulaziz declared himself a king and for good measure gave his name to the country, Saudi Arabia. To unite the kingdom, King Abdulaziz married a daughter of every tribal chief in his realm and produced 45 legitimate sons. Every Saudi king since has been a son of Abdulaziz. How many daughters he produced is unknown. They are not counted. Abdulaziz would not forget that religion and the ulama remained central to his rise to power. He became the kingdom's chief defender of the faith. But Saudi Arabia would have remained an insignificant backwater in world affairs if it were not for the discovery of oil. King Abdulaziz was aware that neighboring states like Iraq and Bahrain had great natural resources, but most experts did not believe that the fields extended to Saudi Arabia. Then, in 1931, they were surprised. There was an American philanthropist called Mr. Crane. Mr. Crane actually came to, to Saudi Arabia and he saw King Abdelaziz. And King Abdelaziz was complaining about the lack of availability of water in the country. Mr. Crane sponsored a geological survey. He wasn't looking for oil. 
So it is by chance that we discovered oil. We were looking for water. And this feat happens until today. Every time we look for water, we find oil. <laughs> But the only way to get it out of the ground was to invite foreign companies into the kingdom. And Abdulaziz feared that inviting foreigners, or infidels, would be resisted by the religious establishment. He invited them anyway. The king asked the companies to come. One of the scholars challenged that. He said the king of Saud is doing something against Islam. So the king knew about this and he asked the scholars to come to his uh, court. When he came, he said, I want you to give me an example why I shall not do that. He said, this is against Islam. He said, prove to me. Prophet Muhammad Sallam used Jews, used Christians. He did not say, these are non Muslim. I cannot be in touch with them. I cannot use, utilize them. Didn't the Prophet use them? The, the scholar said, yes. He said, I'm doing that the same. In 1933, the first foreign oil prospectors started arriving in the kingdom. King Abdulaziz did not care who got the concession as long as they paid the money up front. The British showed interest, but it was the Americans who paid $170,000 in gold for a concession that would turn out to contain the biggest oil fields on earth. The first number of holes was dry, and the question was, why should we continue with this? They had been ordered to stop, and they'd failed to read their mail or whatever, and, and so they did strike the oil, and, and that well uh, is today is, is operating. The Arabian American Oil Company, or Aramco, was created to prospect for oil and market it. America's four largest oil corporations became the sole shareholders. When King Abdaiz uh, went to open the first oil field and he smelled the sulfur and he, it, he was repugnantly uh, surprised by the smell and uh, they told him, but your majesty, this is uh, the, what oil, the sulfur of oil smells. Like. So oh, oh, let me smell more of it. The king still had little idea what riches Saudi oil would soon bring. But by 1945, the U.S. urgently needed oil facilities to help supply its forces fighting around the globe. For President Franklin Roosevelt, oil was an American national security priority. From Yalta, FDR sent a message to the Saudi monarch. <laughs> The contacts were made, but the decision was kept secret until after he left. The Minister of Finance, Abdullah Suleiman, came to the king's wives and said, Abdul Aziz sends his greetings. I am at sea, on my way to meet Roosevelt. We'll be back in two or three days. Any royal trip like this has to be big. And it's not just for a show, no. It's like, you know, unifying all portions of the society with you together. So he had his own advisors. He has some of his own sons, princes. He had some of his tribal chieftains at the time. So it's, it's like a small state moving outside its own state to meet Roosevelt, and it has to be, you know, from portions of all portions of society. It was a very interesting meeting. Here's Roosevelt in his wheelchair, and as you know, he's not a big man, and he's in a wheelchair, and he's on, on, on the deck of the Quincy. And uh, King Abdulaziz, who's about six foot three and six foot four big, stricken with trachoma, not seeing too good, but walking with a cane. And these two hit it off right away. King Abdulaziz started kidding Roosevelt about, you're lucky you're in that wheelchair, they, you can wheel yourself anywhere. And Roosevelt said to him, if you like this wheelchair so good, I'll, I have an extra one here, I'll give it to you. After exchanging gifts, they got down to business. America needed to lease an airport and Navy refueling station for its war against Japan. But it was the security of the Saudi kingdom that was at the forefront of King Abdulaziz's concerns. 
He requested U.S. military assistance and training, and they agreed to construct the Dharan military base. In return, the king guaranteed that the U.S. would always have secure access to Saudi oil. America struck a pact with Saudi Arabia. You give us oil at cheap prices, and we will give you protection. This protection eventually evolved into an American hegemony over the entire Gulf region, and the deal extended to the Gulf region, that this was an American area of influence, and in return for this, it shall be protected from all enemies. And then there was the issue of Palestine. Roosevelt said to him, Your Majesty, you know, I'd like to get your opinion on a problem that I'm facing back home. He said, you know, a lot of my constituents are pressuring me to recognize the Jewish homeland in Palestine. And he said, I'd like to get your thoughts on this. And King Abdelaziz said, Mr. President, what Hitler did to the Jews was a terrible thing. It really was the worst thing that man could do to man. But he said, I don't understand why you're talking about taking land away from us, the Arabs, and giving it to the Jews. We didn't do anything to the Jews. If you want to do something for the Jews, why don't you give them the best part of Germany? When he heard the position of King Abdelaziz about this issue, he said, I could promise you one thing. The promise that I could make is that I will not do or make any decision if I don't consult with your side and with the Jewish side. Both sides have to be consulted in order to reach one decision. Later, FDR sent the king a letter confirming their understanding. In it, he further stated, I will take no action which might prove hostile to the Arab people. Roosevelt died a week after sending the letter. By the time World War II ended, Harry Truman was president of the United States. The unconditional surrender of Japan. Two years later, the UN met to vote on the partition of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. Prince Faisal, the king's second son, arrived in New York confident the U.S. would vote against partition. He had been told that by General George Marshall, former commander of the American army and one of President Truman's top aides. Faisal felt that Marshall had given him an assurance at the United Nations that we would not vote for it, that we would take some other action, and that Marshall had promised him that and that we had failed to do so. The United Kingdom, abstain. Saudi Arabia, no. The United States, yes. When Truman decided otherwise and the U.S. supported the partition of Palestine, Faisal took it as a personal affront. Saudi Arabia joined a failed effort to destroy the nascent Jewish state. It has since never officially recognized Israel and is technically still at war with it. But the king still knew he needed American protection. The king made his views very clear, including his sense of disappointment. But his main concern at that time was encirclement. Uh, he felt that with the Hashemites in Iraq and in Jordan, that he was encircled. So the sense that there were hostile elements around the country coveting its riches and counting upon its internal weakness, its limited ability to defend itself, hence it needed an outside protector. Just before his death in 1953, the ailing founder of the kingdom started delegating his power to his sons. His eldest, Prince Saud, who had accompanied him in battles, was designated the next king. His second, Prince Faisal, was to mind foreign affairs. He prepared for his succession with the help of Prince Saud and Prince Faisal, the eldest. 
He told them, your unity will continue my reign and preserve the family and the unity and prosperity of the country. Avoid differences. Beware if you separate. When King Abdelaziz died, people were afraid. He was the force, he was the symbol. He was almost the bureaucracy himself. Everything has to come through his desk because it was a nation that he, it's a startup, like a corporation today. You find the entrepreneur who starts a corporation, uh, they've got their hands on things. King Abdelaziz was, was a power and he was strong and he, was, he brought strength to the Roman age. You could see what he did, bringing the country together. Saud, on the other hand, people that dealt with him never considered him bright. I don't recall anything substantive that Saud ever said uh, on whatever the issues might be. Very pleasant, very nice, but inconsequential. He loved the desert in the sense that he had these huge tents with, uh, with every amenity possible. I mean, the uh, air conditioning and all the latest uh, food from Paris and the uh, States and everything else. He loved the trappings of being king. The palaces and the adulation of the crowds, the foreign dignitaries would come and talk to him and uh, all of his retainers, of course, acting uh, uh, with due respect. And uh, so, I mean, he loved being king. The only thing is he wasn't king in any substantive way. He was soft. And if you're going to be a ruler in Arabia, you've got to be tough. You've got to be like a hawk. You've got to be like a falcon. That's what gets respect. And at the end of the day, Saud's generosity went so far, but he wasn't tough enough. The king also enjoyed American hospitality. He became a regular visitor to Saudi Arabia's oil-rich eastern province, where the Americans lived very differently than the Saudis. When the Americans came to the eastern province with the Aramco company, they had to live in a compound area Inside, they have their own condition, situation, like in the United States. Outside, they have to live with the Saudis as the tradition exists. They started building these camps. It was new to us. Air conditioning was new to us. All these things. And then, what was good about Aramco is they shared it. They used to get canned food. We've never seen canned food at the time. And we used to fight over uh, who takes the can, the empty cans, because this, these are toys for us as kids. So we were always glad to see the Americans come in, and especially the chewing gum. I mean, the chewing gum was a, a big contributing factor of liking. I remember the first time when we had a refrigerator that was supplied by, by Aramco to a number of people. One, my, my father was one of them. We as kids were sitting there, must be 16 hours, to, to see how ice is going to be formulated within this refrigerator. Of course, it took 16 hours because every time we opened the refrigerator, it, it loses its freezing impact. So we were absolutely was magic when we saw a cube of ice. We didn't know, really know, know the world of technology. We just thought it was different and, uh, and it, is the, it is America. The Saudis were interested in one thing and that is that their oil industry was preserved and being handled in a way where they could negotiate and they could increase the oil prices and so on. And they had extremely good relations with Aramco. They were making a lot of money, but they were spending it foolishly. The country was broke. They had to borrow money. They borrowed money from Aramco. King Saud was much criticized for his handling of finances, but little was known about his other weakness, a safely guarded secret, which contributed to his downfall.
we had a vice president for Aramco whose name was Floyd Oliger, and he was with the king one time, and the king was tired, he was sick. And so Oliger said to him, Your Majesty, why don't you go out into the desert, do a little hunting and relax, and we have a wonderful guest house. So uh, they thought that was a good idea. When the king landed, one of the things they were unloading from the plane was liqueur and, and, uh, and uh, hard whiskey. Well, we took a look at this, and, and, uh, and where did they put the stuff? They put the stuff under the king's bed in the guest house. So we, of course, we were kind of shocked. And during the stay, we could see that they would drink this stuff straight. But it was kept very quiet. King Saud's drinking was kept quiet in part because the king was an important asset for the Americans. Since Kamal Abdel Nasser's overthrow of the king of Egypt in 1952, the balance of power in the region had changed. Nasser aligned himself with the Soviet Union and proclaimed himself a socialist and pan-Arabist. For both Saudi Arabia and America, this was a threat. The Cold War was at its peak, where you had two mighty empires battling out across the whole planet, destroying nations in their, in their path. And you had the end of colonialism and these newly liberated countries coming out full of vitality, full of energy and wanting to prove themselves. And the theme was out with the old, in with the new. Who cares whether the old was good or bad, it doesn't matter. We want to change. Khalas, we want to change and get everything new. So in this kind of environment, we are who are quintessentially old. You know what I mean? Uh, we were the odd ones out. We were going against this, the, 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 the trend. We did not want to be part of that uh, new thinking in terms of socialism, communism. We've already had our ism. We've already had Islam. We were happy and we united around Islam. And anything that would have come to Saudi Arabia would have unraveled the country. Nasser wanted Saudi oil under his control, saying it belonged to all Arab peoples. The Americans moved to shore up support for King Saud. Saudi Arabia is absolutely a linchpin, a key to our relationship in the whole area. So oil is at the very center of that, and Russian power coming down there and having control of those oil fields would have been a major, major blow to us. The Eisenhower administration had the idea that perhaps King Saud could be built up in a political fashion that might make him a contender with Nasser in terms of leadership in the Arab world. The White House said, uh, we are inviting His Majesty and eight of his uh, retinue. And <laughs> we took that to the king and particularly to his advisors. They looked at us and we looked at them and there was to be no way there would only be eight. Well, uh, one thing led to another and uh, by the time they got on the ship, there were about 80. After arriving in New York, King Saud and his entourage flew to Washington. Saud became the first Saudi monarch invited to America on a state visit. Eisenhower met him at the airport, which was very, very unusual, and he just determined that he uh, was going to treat Saud as his great good friend. Eisenhower wanted a renewal of the lease on the Dharan Air Base, a useful strategic asset in the Cold War. King Saud wanted the money that the U.S. would pay to extend the lease. My father at the time, you know, was uh, negotiating uh, the, the, the agreement. He was uh, uh, very sensitive to not calling it a base. It was a transit place for the Americans to take fueling, period. The exact details of the Dharan Agreement are revealed in this original copy of the Accord. 
This agreement constitutes, until today, the basis of U.S.-Saudi military cooperation. In exchange for our free use of the Dahran airfield, they wanted all kinds of materials. They wanted tanks, for one thing, and they wanted training, and they wanted planes, and they wanted uh, anything we would give them. The agreement was celebrated with great pomp. King Saud was given full honors. The official visit was glittering and fine, but when it was all over, one sort of felt, you know, what is this all about? Because he's clearly not the man for this. Eisenhower's plan to build up Saud as the alternative Arab leader seemed doomed to fail. King Saud spent much of the money from the Dharan lease on luxury trips to Europe. A rift was fast developing in the family. His extravagance wasn't the big issue. Kings can be extravagant and still remain king. The big issue was the running of the government. That was the biggest problem. It was all personal. We were really worried about Saudi Arabia. I mean, I'm not talking just about Aramco. I'm talking about the people in the U.S. government and everybody were worried about Saudi Arabia and were realized that if anybody was going to save Saudi Arabia, it was going to be Faisal. And a lot of people worried, as we did, living in Riyadh, that there'd be a kind of a civil war. The Al Saud brothers realized that something had to be done. The step of removing a monarch is something that is not likely taken by anyone. It is a very serious, very dangerous step. Removing one monarch, well, you can always remove another. So the brothers all got together, all of them. It was their own best interest. They had to make a move. And they decided in November of 64 to go to the religious leaders and uh, they decided this is the way they could do it. And they got a fatwa from the religious leaders sanctioning the abdication and sanctioning Faisal's taking over the throne. Once more, the Saudi monarchy was saved from the brink of disaster by the ulama. The family decision to depose Saud uh, in the 1960s was really more of a turning point than the death of Abdulaziz uh, in 1953 uh, because it was finally coming into the modern world but also proving that the desert democracy of sitting around the campfire and the family picking the, the toughest man for the job could work in the 20th century and the speed with which the change was actually accomplished and the new direction that the country took. That, I think, was the decisive turning point in the history of Saudi Arabia in the middle of the 20th century. King Saud and his entourage were quietly asked to leave the country. The ailing Saudi monarch spent his last years exiled in Athens, Greece. My first year at Georgetown, 1964, I was called in by the dean of the uh, of the university. Uh, who, when I went in the office, I thought I had done something wrong or something, and he said, "Well, now, Turkey, Annie, your situation has changed, and are you thinking that perhaps we could provide you with with some bodyguards?" In those days, there was no internet, there was no instant news service. I had absolutely no idea that on that day, Monday, that my father had, uh, had become king. King Faisal had a lot to do. But almost every aspect of bringing the kingdom up to date was bound to bring him into conflict with the ulama. In their view, every innovation threatened Islam. Essentially, modernity means westernization. This is the fact. It's a, like a buzzword. 
Okay? Modern means westernized. This is where we have problems because people want to run their lives better, but not necessarily sacrificing their own culture and their own history in order to become copies of Frenchmen or copies of the English or false Americans. They don't want that. He decided that there should be uh, girls' schools in Saudi Arabia, and there was an uproar about it. All the old fathers came along and said this was awful. Uh, who knew what would happen when the girls got education? And Faisal said, in that case, don't send your daughters to the schools. Uh, and if you don't want, if a majority of people in your village or town don't want a girls' school, you won't have one. But those who do want to have a school must have one. I would have been illiterate if they didn't have um, uh, schools at the time. And in fact, I was lucky to go to one of the early private schools that were established in the 60s. Female education was put under the directory of a separate body that would control the curriculum uh, and make sure that what the girls are taught in schools uh, is actually suitable for them as girls and as women. So in that way, um, he managed to reconcile uh, the need for female education and also the requirements of the ulama. Gradually, indeed, the number of girls' schools was increased and then girls were admitted to universities and so on. All this was done by keeping just a little way ahead of public opinion and always being willing to stop and wait for public opinion to catch up. But reaching compromise with the ulama was a constant battle. Leading Wahhabi clerics were ever vigilant. One day, I get a telephone call from our people in Dharan and says, Mike, they're banning vanilla. The vanilla extract is being banned. I said, why? He said, well, it's got a little alcohol in it. And, and you know, they're going crazy. Now, anything with anything, any alcohol in it, anything. And, and they say to me, look, we can't make ice cream, we can't make bread, we can't make cakes, we can't go on. It's a big problem. We've got to do something about it. <laughs> so, I happened to be in one of my visits to the king, and I was saying, telling him about this, and, uh, and he was amazing. He was amazing, really. He picks up the phone, and the vanilla was allowed in. But to keep the peace with conservatives, King Faisal made Saudi Arabia a sanctuary for extremist Muslims from abroad. When governments in Egypt and Syria cracked down on fundamentalist religious scholars, King Faisal invited them to teach Saudi Arabian youth. Faisal's decision had far-reaching consequences. There was an influx of them here, and where did they work? They worked in the education and in other professional works, and uh, that's when the problem started here. Many of today's Saudi radicals studied under Egyptian and Syrian fundamentalists. They misused their hospitality. They dealt with, we dealt with them honestly, and they, and they dealt with, that un, un, with us un, underhandedly. And uh, that is a mistake that's not going to be repeated. Religious conservatives staged one of their biggest protests in 1965, when Faisal approved TV broadcasts in the kingdom. They consider that broadcasting t television is a sin and against uh, because they consider them to be images. And we're not supposed to show images. And they consider that this was uh, rank heresy and that the government had become uh, in league with the devil. <laughs> so what he did is he had somebody recite the Quran and broadcast that and told people, you see this, it's like a sword. You can use a sword for good or you can use a sword to assassinate so it's a tool really it's like the internet today the same debate goes on a nephew of the king sided with religious conservatives it would eventually have drastic personal consequences one of Faisal's brother's sons staged uh, a demonstration Prince Khalid ibn Saad in 1965 and uh, this demonstration was objecting to the introduction of television on the basis that it was un-Islamic. A group of people got together, not 
numbering more than a hundred. They headed towards the, the television tower in, in Riyadh and tried to break in to bring down the television tower. They fired at the guards, the guards fired back and the prince was killed. The father then went to Faisal and said, uh, you've got to punish the soldier who killed my son. And Faisal said, no. Uh, I'm sorry your son was killed, but he was breaking the law. He fired on the police. They fired back at him, and the policeman is guiltless. I am responsible. In the spring of 1967, war was brewing. Nasser was moving troops to Israel's border and ordered the UN out. Uniting against Israel, Faisal reconciled with Nasser. Could I ask His Majesty what sequence of events he would like to see now in the Middle East? The first thing is the extermination of Israel. Fearing an attack was imminent, Israel launched a massive preemptive war. In just six days, the bulk of Arab armies were destroyed. It was a devastating effect that, that the defeat in 67 had on all of us. For King Faisal to see that the rest of Palestine, including the jewel of, of, of Jerusalem, had been taken over by, by the Israelis. He, he felt a personal a loss and, and a personal uh, affront. After 1967 and the fall of uh, Jerusalem to the Israelis, uh, that was a turning point in his life. He never smiled again. Arab leaders were humiliated. Nasser had falsely accused the U.S. of helping the Israelis. On Aramco's compounds, hundreds of Saudis rioted against America. I got orders almost immediately from Washington to move out the American community. And I went to see Faisal right away. Faisal said it's very important that we retain close diplomatic relations and that the American community remain. And his concern then was that the United States press Israel, do something to press Israel to get out of the West Bank Gaza and Sinai and East Jerusalem, which we promised to do. Being friends with the U.S. was, was, was difficult, it was difficult because of this Palestinian problem. But so after 67, it got real, it got real tough. So the Arab League got together and said to the Saudis, you, you people are nothing but a bunch of American stooges. You don't even control your own oil. The Arab League pressured Faisal to use oil as a weapon. Between 1960 and 1970, this is a period of 10 years. The price of oil in the market did not go up one cent, not one single cent. The value of an equivalent barrel of Pepsi Cola was more expensive than an oil barrel at the time. By the 1970s, Saudi Arabia had become increasingly aware of the strategic importance of its natural resource. It started to negotiate for the ownership of Aramco. At the same time, the Arab-Israeli conflict was brewing without resolution. The tension in the Middle East was brewing indeed. Uh, however, the I don't think that we fully recognized how much it was brewing. We tended to uh, downplay the uh, statements that came out of the Middle East, and most notably the letter that was received from King Faisal. And that letter said, you must do something about the Palestinian problem or there will be a deterioration. And we tended to think that that was uh, just some more hot air on the part of the king. In October 1973, 
another Arab-Israeli war broke out. Despite the tension, the Arab attack on Israel was a total surprise. In the first day, the Egyptian and Syrian armies had gained considerable ground. The Israelis pressed us with regard to the running down of their supplies. And uh, the administration did not wish to um, be seen to be responsible for the collapse of Israel. Uh, the uh, Arab states, Syria and Egypt, were armed with Soviet weapons. The president took the view that we do not want to see a triumph of Soviet weaponry over American weaponry, and ultimately we began to ship supplies to Israel. In the midst of the war, the U.S. began airlifting supplies to Israel. Under pressure from the Arab League, King Faisal acted. I got the phone call uh, the morning after the, the airlift and uh, asked to come to Riyadh to see the king as soon as I could, which went now. And the king was furious uh, about this. He saw no way to do anything but to boycott. I said to him, I, I just really don't see how you're going to do it. And the king just simply said, you are going to do it. Faisal ordered Aramco to stop pumping. Oil became scarce. Prices quadrupled, and the shock sent world economies reeling. President Nixon sent his Secretary of State Kissinger on an urgent mission to Saudi Arabia. Some people thought because of my Jewish background that would be a handicap in conducting Middle East diplomacy. Kissinger raised with me the question whether the fact that he was Jewish might affect Faisal. And uh, I had to tell him that it might. But I said, you have to remember also that he feels we have in the past, on a good many occasions, after having made commitments to him, let him down. So you better be sure that what you say to him that we may do, we intend to do. He was a very austere looking man, very sharp features. And it was a very long room. And I had to walk that whole room towards him with his black robed advisors standing there. It was a beautiful scene. Uh, but I must say, he treated me with extraordinary courtesy. There was no light conversation, there were no jokes, there was no humor, and all in all it was fairly tense. But uh, the meeting went, went, I think, probably as well as could be expected. Both of them saw that the other wasn't wearing horns. President Nixon was eager for me to raise the embargo. King Faisal really wanted to talk more about the peace process in the Middle East. He made it pretty clear that he couldn't lift the embargo until there was some progress towards peace. Kissinger began working on a peace plan, but progress was slow. The oil embargo remained. The Pentagon started to consider military options. Kissinger gave an interview in which he said the United States cannot stand having its oil supplies disrupted. This will hurt the entire economy. And if it should become necessary, the United States would be prepared to invade, to intervene in Saudi Arabia to take over the oil fields. Kissinger's statement was taken as a verbal warning, but a recently declassified secret British intelligence memorandum reveals that five months into the embargo, the military option was a reality. Dr. Kissinger said no great power will allow itself to be strangulated and uh, he called me up and said jump in behind me and I did. I was asked at a press conference whether we had the military capacity to move in the Middle East and I said we indeed have that military capability. A post lesson said I used hard language. We tried to make clear that there was a point at which we would have to look after the requirements of national security 
And so we implied that uh, if we were pushed absolutely against the wall, we might secure the oil uh, by our own means. Oh, yes, we were, we were quite capable, and we were thinking about a possible move into the Persian Gulf on a contingency basis. But if we were ordered to move, we would have moved. King Faisal answered back that, you know, we come from the desert. We have been living on camel milk and dates, and we can easily go back and live in the desert again. He was not impressed. We did not get a telegram from King Faisal congratulating us on those statements. The oil embargo was having a major impact on the war in Vietnam. Fuel supplies were running dangerously low. Behind the scenes, a solution was concocted. The announcement, from my standpoint, over at the Pentagon came in the form of a cable from Exxon, which said that Aramco members were cutting off deliveries to the Sixth Fleet in the Mediterranean, as well as our forces in Europe. I wasn't aware of how bad it was until one night I got a telephone call from uh, the Deputy Secretary of, of Defense under Jim Schlesinger. And he said, Mike, we have a problem. We need to talk to you. I met with Secretary Schlesinger and, and Bill Clements. And that's when they told me that they were fighting communists and this boycott was killing them. It was just impossible for us to keep our Navy and our kids in Vietnam supplied. And I talked with our top people, our jungers, and I remember the two of us went out to see the king. And the king came in and was obviously irritated. He was picking hairs out of his bisht. <laughs> that was a good sign that he was irritated. Well, we, we, gave, him, we gave it to him exactly the way that uh, uh, Bill Clements and, and Jim Schlesinger had told us, that we were fighting communism. We knew how he felt about them and that we needed his help. Okay, he said, well, God help you. You probably ought to do it, but don't get caught. Everyone knew that this was something extraordinary. And for years, it was a, it was a secret. By 1974, the boycott was over. But continued higher oil prices gave Faisal great wealth and status throughout the Arab world. Then in March 1975, his past caught up with him. My father was uh, receiving uh, the then Minister of Petroleum of Kuwait. He was followed into the room by a nephew of the king. The king's nephew, Prince Faisal bin Musad, came to take his revenge. It was his brother who had been killed by police during the 1965 TV tower demonstration. Remember on the TV thing? Uh, and this guy was a little nuts anyway, of booze and all kinds of stuff. And there, the guards and everybody, they don't know the kid. They think he's part of the entourage from Kuwait. When uh, the minister bowed to say hello to the king, um, he uh, took out a pistol and, and shot the king over the shoulder of the, of the, of the minister. King Faisal's assassination came as a violent shock. Especially that the assassin was a family member. But the succession had already been decided. In 1975, Khalid bin Abdulaziz became Saudi Arabia's fourth king. King Khalid was a delightful man. He was not so keenly interested in politics as King Faisal was and as King Fahad uh, was later on. He liked to talk about the desert, he liked to talk about hawking. Uh, when I took visitors to see him, he wanted to talk about his hawks. One didn't discuss politics with King Khalid on the whole. He would say, see my brother uh, Fahad about that. 
Saudi Arabia was enjoying an embarrassment of riches. With a tiny population estimated at four million and only half a million literate male adults, it was hard to put to work an income of nearly a billion dollars a week. It was a lot of cash. Saudi Arabia embarked on a rapid course of buying and building. Foreign contractors rushed in. Saudi Arabia was the only country that was booming. There wasn't any work for Western contractors anywhere else in the world. So everybody was converging on Saudi Arabia. Everybody was desperate for a piece of the, of the action. You would go away for a summer holiday and you'd come back and you'd get lost. You wouldn't recognize the city you had left just a couple of months before. So things that would normally have taken 20 years to do were done in a, in, in a few months. And it made people a little bit crazy. A little bit crazy. We were building two schools every three days. We had to build seven universities. We were trying to do so much in a constrained period of time. So the debate was, do we import foreign labor or do we wait until we train our labor and then carry the projects ourselves? And I was of the opinion then that the decision that was taken, the time to import foreign labor was a great decision. So you began to have this skewered system where the native population didn't do very much and most of the people who did the work were expatriates. If you look at even in Saudi Arabia today, population is 16 million, but the expatriates are perhaps six to seven million. Among those that accumulated massive wealth during the boom time was the Bin Laden family, becoming the principal builders to the royals. Another consequence of the boom was massive amounts of official corruption. Much of the corruption concerned Saudi purchases of Western military equipment. Deals were riddled with influence peddling, bribes, and oversized commissions. There was also real estate fraud. The main device for getting money from the government into the pockets of the princes is through land sales, but only the princes can register land in the desert as theirs. An ordinary citizen of Dalaf land cannot go out and say, I'm gonna take this piece of land and put a marker. Only the princes can do that. So when the government then needs land to build a project, that um, they have to buy the land from the princes and at astronomical prices. If downtown New York, if not downtown Tokyo at that time, unbelievable prices. The way I answer the corruption charges is this. In the last 30 years, we have made, we have in, implemented a development program that was approximately uh, close to $400 billion worth, okay? Now, look at the whole country, where it was, where it is now. And I'm, I am confident, you know, after you look at it, you could not have done all of that for less than, let's say, 350 billion. Now, if you tell me that building this whole country and spending 350 billion out of 400 billion, that we had a misused or get corrupted with 50 billion, I'll tell you yes, but I'll take that any time. There are so many countries in the third world that have oil that are still 30 years behind. But more important, more important, hey, who, who are you to tell me this? I mean, I see every time all the scandals here or in England or in Europe. What I'm trying to tell you is, so what? The Saudi elite became notorious big spenders in the casinos of Europe. The royals, with their huge monthly allowances, spent seemingly endless vacations there. Saudi leaders lost credibility and respect, especially among religious conservatives. They're so corrupt in every sense, 
in Islamic sense, in financial sense, in administrative sense, in, in every sense, that no way they can reform and go back um, uh, and become faithful to the country, let alone faithful to Islam. So the only way to save the country in every sense, even in the basic human sense, is to change the whole royal family. In 1979, across the Gulf in Iran, another corrupt absolute monarchy, also backed by the U.S., fell. It was overthrown in part by fervent Muslims. The royal family was scared of the same thing happening to them that happened to the Shah and namely that the royal family or the Saudi system would be overthrown. There was good reason. The pace of change in Saudi Arabia brought the contradictions between Islam and modernity into the open. Again, many in Saudi society wanted to put the brakes on westernization. The problem was these foreigners brought in their nasty foreign habits with them and that exposed the, the royal family to criticism from the religious right. With the oil boom, it was natural that you are pumping a massive dose of Western culture in a country that is loaded with people, 70% of whom perhaps are extremely conservative and really extremely Muslim fundamentalist almost radicals. One of the warning signals where the society is saying, look, 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 enough, we're, we're, this is changing too fast for me, I can't keep up, slow down, was in 1979 with the hijacking of the uh, mosque in Mecca. I think this was a symptom of this trauma you just can't drag people into the 21st century by, by the scruff of the next. You can't do that. On November 20th, 1979, several hundred Islamic radicals took over the holiest of the Islamic holy places, the mosque at Mecca. They took the microphone in the mosque and announced for the rest of the world that, that the Messiah was here and that people should come and pledge their allegiance uh, to him. When the incident at the mosque occurred, the government and society realized that the ship had come unmoored from its fundamentals. It was a warning bell. Society was awakened came back to God and heeded the causes that might lead to a greater catastrophe. I remember asking my Saudi friends, what do these people want? And then they say, well, they, they want to basically go back. Um, they want to go back in time to a purer world, um, to an Islam that wasn't threatened by the West and where the words of the Prophet, as, as they believe it today, ruled um, and I said well how do they practically plan to achieve that in modern Saudi Arabia are they going to tell everybody to get rid of their cars and stop watching the television he said yes so far as I know that's what they want and uh, uh, th they have this hopeless attitude to the modern world they were asking the nation and people to go back to the original Islam in primitive way. So they were against television, they were against schools, they were against universities. They just want the country to be governed by mullahs, by religious scholars. They didn't believe in governments. They think government is kafir, it's non Muslim any longer. They believe that all the new methods and means of life is nothing. They want, again, like the, all the Khwan, they wanted, what they wanted is jihad against infidel. The royals went to the ulama, and the clerics issued a fatwa based on the verses of the Quran. The fatwa allowed the government to use all necessary force to retake the mosque. 
the meaning of it was that these people were apostates who had taken over the, uh, the, the mosque, and therefore anything could be done to get them out of there. After an 18-day standoff, the Saudis, with fatwa in hand, routed the militants. 120 soldiers died. The leader of the insurgents, Juhayman al-Uteba, was a direct descendant of the Ikhwan, the Bedouin warriors who had fought for and then rebelled against King Abdulaziz. Juhayman and 62 others were beheaded. We killed the extremists of 1979. But later on, like a few months after uh, we killed them, we adopted their ideology. We gave them what they wanted when they were alive. So um, in every level in our society, I'm talking about the educational system, I'm talking about the media discourse, I'm talking about the relationship between the government and the people, I'm talking about even the relationship between people and the people. We started competing uh, on how to appear more conservative, just to protect our, our reputation and to protect sometimes our safety. We had to pretend we were something that we actually were not. As the Saudi royal family moved to increase its religious standing, millions of dollars were diverted to religious education under the ulama. They taught Wahhabism as the only true form of Islam. And holy war against infidels as the obligation of every believer. New theological schools and universities were built to produce more clerics to help spread the word. Saudi charities raised millions more for the cause. We don't have taxes in the kingdom. People don't pay taxes. However, we have a religious tax that's dictated by our religion. That is compulsory, but not enforceable. Why? Because it's left to one's faith and belief and so on. And it is supposed to go to the poor. If you cannot find anybody needy, you go to the next neighborhood or the next village, or the next city, or the next country. Well, in Saudi Arabia, God blessed us with a lot of wealth. We take care of almost all our people. So we send it to Afghanistan, to Bosnia, to Senegal, to uh, anywhere in the world, to Africa, Asia, my point, the Arab world, as charities. able to open up mosques in London, in Africa, in the United States, in uh, Southeast Asia. And that was seen as part of their responsibility as wealthy Muslims. They had to share that wealth with Muslims um, elsewhere, and they had to be seen as uh, supporting Muslim causes. In 1979, the Wahhabis found a rallying cause like no other. The Soviet Union, a godless communist power, had invaded a Muslim nation, Afghanistan. Saudi Arabia and the U.S. made a secret deal to contribute an equal amount to finance the war. Thousands of young Saudis were sent to fight alongside the Mujahideen. The Saudi religious education and also the institutions of higher learning began to produce masses of young graduates who are very well conversant in Islamic theology but who could not really be absorbed easily in the economy. And the Afghan war in the 80s provided an opportunity to absorb some of those Saudi youth. And this was actually encouraged by the government, who probably uh, saw it as a way to release some of the tension. But they didn't realize the potential for an exploding situation later on. For almost a decade, some 20,000 young Saudi volunteers made the trek to Afghanistan. There, they would acquire military skills and come to believe that dedicated Islamic fighters could defeat a superpower. In 
In 1982, Crown Prince Fahad became king after his brother Khalid died of a heart attack. The Iran-Iraq war was raging on his doorstep. Fahad befriended Saddam Hussein, a fellow Sunni, and gave him money and weapons to battle Shia Iran. Eight years later, the Saudis were not prepared for a sudden betrayal. I'm sitting at home relaxing when the phone rings and my mother is calling. She was in Paris. Her voice is very disturbed. How are you? I'm fine. How are things with you? Fine. What is happening with you? Nothing. What's happening? What's, what's going on? Didn't you hear? No. What happened? Iraq has just invaded Kuwait. It was like a bomb had been dropped on me. I had no idea. Because at the time, we didn't have satellite television, and there was a total blackout to the news. Where if you turned on the television, nothing. The Saudis had not decided whether to announce it to their own population or not. Of course, everybody knew it. So it was, a, it was so strange, so weird, and it was such an insight into the kind of paralysis, incomprehension that the regime found itself in the middle of. In some ways, King Fahad, although a shrewd and to some degrees quite ruthless man, had many of the faults of his brother Saud. Um, an eagerness to please everybody, a belief that um, everything could be sorted out with, with the money, which was pretty plentiful, that all would be for the best. And the bankruptcy of that, I think, was exposed to start with by the first Gulf War um, and Saudi Arabia's inability, after spending all this money, actually to cope with this threat themselves, this military threat from Iraq. How could you justify spending so much money on an army that can't be used for any combat, real combat situation? And uh, this brought uh, to the forefront this problem with the corruption, the commissions, the military contracts, and the inability of uh, uh, a sovereign state to defend itself in case of outside aggression. these first days of the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait, Osama bin Laden offered his services to the royals. Bin Laden went to see some, uh, some Saudi officials uh, at the time. He told them he could bring his army uh, from Afghanistan, his Mujahideen army, to, uh, to uh, repel the, uh, the Iraqi invaders from, from Kuwait. He was trying to meet with the king. That's why I met with him. So he had about 60 pages typed in his hand, and he started reading. He said, we have uh, some people who are ready to fight. He said, how many? He said, about 15 to 20,000. He mentions, he said, I want to make it clear. We need no weapons or equipment. We are very well equipped. We didn't need any support from anybody. And then he said, we are not going to fight for Kuwait. What we are about is to protect the Holy Lands, Mecca and the Medina. That's our goal. He was told politely, thank you very much for your proposition. We will study it, but we'll get in touch with you. Don't call us, we'll call you. Dismissing bin Laden was easy. The real dilemma was how to allow hundreds of thousands of American non-Muslim troops into the kingdom. This was certain to rile Islamic conservatives. Everything in this country revolves somehow around religion. Now, this is something that a Westerner will never understand. And I'm not even going to try to make them understand because they simply won't. The religion is the law. It permeates the culture. It is rooted in the history. It is part of the DNA, if you like, of the Saudis. Therefore, any challenge has to go through the Islamic filter. We needed to understand whether it was permissible for the government of Saudi Arabia to invite hundreds of thousands of Westerners to come on Saudi soil in order to fight another Muslim country, which is Iraq. There were some questions about whether the Saudis would accept U.S. forces. 
the president asked Secretary Cheney to go down and, uh, and meet with the Saudi officials uh, to tell them that we felt it was important to put some forces in there to deter the possible action by the Iraqis to move down the peninsula. U.S. Defense Secretary Dick Cheney, General Colin Powell, and General Schwarzkopf arrived in Saudi Arabia armed with satellite pictures showing the Iraqi army poised to move across the Saudi border. I thought he was shaken by what he saw in those photos. After listening to General Schwarzkopf's briefing on the proposed American response, the king said, come. Uh, and then the crown prince said, don't you think there should be some consultation? And uh, Fahad said, there's no time. If we delay, we may end up like Kuwait. There is no Kuwait anymore, he said. And Abdullah said, yes, there's a Kuwait. There is still a Kuwait. And Fahad said, yes, and its territory consists of hotel rooms in Cairo and Paris and London. And Abdullah said, I take your point. I agree. King Fahad went back to the ulama and asked for a ruling or fatwa. King Fahad asked the senior ulama and they said that if you cannot work a peaceful settlement then you must side with the victim to reverse the aggression and if you have to avail yourself of support from non-Muslims you do so. The deal was concluded. More than half a million US troops started arriving in the kingdom and neighboring countries. But regardless of the fatwa, hardline Saudi imams protested. This was the biggest mistake committed by America. It caused all the hate and hostility. They came with their traditions, their army, and unfortunately with their behaviors, and wanted to force it on Muslims. During these first months of Desert Shield, Saudi anxiety was amplified by an unexpected problem, money. The U.S. administration was bent on charging the Saudis for the war. We were pulling together the coalition, we were furnishing the military effort, and we were in effect saving uh, the bacon of, uh, of a lot of people in the region, including uh, the Kuwaitis and the Saudis. They were very well-to-do countries, and, and it was our thought that they should contribute to their defense. King Fahd was a very uh, uh, warm and engaging uh, person to deal with. I remember when I first raised the issue of, of payment, he said, don't even talk to me about that. He said, what is money between friends? And in a situation like this, I don't even, he said, you just go to the finance minister and you tell him what you think is appropriate or what you need. And, and that was the way he approached it. The costs were picked out of thin air. They were, no one really knew. And in some cases, we asked for figures that were simply concocted on the back of an envelope. Um, in the end, what we took in covered the expenses of the war and probably a little more. Secretary Baker and I had a number of arguments about this because I felt that uh, we were asking the Saudis for too much. Ambassador Freeman said that uh, the pot is not quite as uh, rich as it has been, but there's nothing that's more important. He didn't say this, I did. Nothing more important than their security and their continued well-being. And it, would, it clearly was fair and reasonable for the Saudis to contribute substantially they spent some 50 billion dollars and the result was that um, they started the war with no national debt they ended it financially lamed 
and continue to suffer uh, from the debt that the war produced. The presence of Americans had other consequences. Some Saudi women were inspired to challenge long-standing social taboos, such as the ban on women driving. American ladies were actually driving around Riyadh. So we thought, this is encouraging. Why don't we actually go and ask for that? We just said, OK, we will meet at the parking lot of the Safeway in Riyadh at 3 o'clock. We didn't want to tackle any other issues except the driving. Suddenly, all these cars started arriving. There was about two dozen cars and all these very elegant, albeit covered Saudi women, coming out of their cars to take the driver's seat was the Pakistani, the Indonesian drivers just sitting on the sidewalk in front of the supermarket. We were uh, six doctors from the university who have PhDs. Also, we were like, you know, teachers from the, in, in public schools. Some of the ladies who were shopping in the Safeway, they saw all these ladies actually getting into the car and they asked, what are you doing? And we said, we're going for a demonstration. They said, we'll just participate. That's wonderful. So they just get their drivers and, and get to the car with their things and they drove with us. I mean, I remember one guy, he said, a Saudi, and he said, good for you. He was, he was really happy. Now, within... Ten minutes, these religious police, who are the guys with the beard and the short dresses, started swooping in on the demonstration. You know, Mutawas, of course, in, in, in our you know, mind, uh, are um, very scary. <laughs> I have to tell you that. I, mean, I remember that guy, he was really very fat. And he came and he asked me, You stop your car. And I said, and I said OK. Forty-seven women were arrested. The ulama called the driving a source of depravity. Good evening. The news from Channel 2, Saudi Arabian Television. The Ministry of the Interior would like to announce to all citizens and residents that all women are absolutely prohibited from driving cars in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It added any woman who violates this regulation will be penalized. In every city within the kingdom and all the um, mosques, millions of papers were distributed with our names and telephone numbers and, and that we are Westerners and we are against the will of the societies and we have to be, you know, uh, prosecuted or, or whatever. The notice called upon clerics to punish the women as they saw fit. swift coalition victory in Kuwait, security of the kingdom seemed assured. But the continued presence of American soldiers in the land of the two holy mosques was a major irritant. The fear was, of course, those people come and never leave. This is the experience of the Middle East uh, historically. And constantly we reassured the Saudis that we planned after the liberation of Kuwait to, to leave. Until it became apparent that Saddam Hussein was not going to fall from power, we didn't withdraw. So we stayed in Saudi Arabia with no agreement, no understanding um, between us and the Saudis. The US military uh, clearly understood that their presence in Saudi Arabia was politically irritating uh, and in many respects um, uh, dangerous to the, long, the, the good health of the relationship. Osama bin Laden would seize upon the issue, and his followers would go on the offensive. On the morning of November 13, 1995, a massive bomb shook Riyadh. Four American military contractors and one American soldier died. Those arrested said they were inspired by bin Laden. When the explosion in Riyadh happened, we were tracking bin Laden since the early 90s. We stripped him of his citizenship. We knew that he was a danger, and we knew that he was planning mischief against Saudi Arabia. Osama bin Laden began his whole quest as directed against the Saudi royal family. I mean, his main enemy was the regime. 
and his main goal was to overthrow this regime. And then he moved philosophically to the natural conclusion that the people who are supporting this regime are the American military. And I will get much more resonance for my message if I were to attack the American military. And I detected for the first time in Saudi Arabia a certain amount of sympathy with this act. In 1996, another bombing in Dharan killed 19 American soldiers. U.S.-Saudi relations were coming under increasing strain. At this critical juncture, King Fahad was incapacitated by a stroke. Crown Prince Abdullah comes into the picture at this point in time, and the country is a different country, again, because things have happened in this country, and most importantly, it is the introduction of Arabic language satellite programs. Beamed in TV programs were beyond the control of the royals. For the first time, Saudi citizens began to see for themselves what others saw as the shortcomings of their country. The people were exposed to reports about lack of civil rights and political freedoms and royal corruption. There is no more control of the news. This is a new paradigm. And the crown prince himself is part of that. The crown prince spends his time watching Al Jazeera. And while CNN would be showing the American audience uh, an American reporter riding in an Israeli tank. Al Jazeera would be showing an Arab audience, Palestinian kids being chased or beaten up by Israeli soldier. And this phenomenon cannot be divorced from the way the Saudi leadership is now reacting to the United States. Gruesome images of the Arab-Israeli conflict became part of Saudi's daily viewing. Throughout the 90s, U.S. efforts to forge a lasting peace foundered. The Saudis remained on the sidelines while continuing to support Arafat and militant groups like Hamas. But when they sensed President Bush might abandon the peace process, they took a more active role. As soon as the Bush administration came into office, we had discussions with them about the American policy in the region. We were urging the United States to get engaged in the peace process. And when there was an escalation of violence and the president was asked about Sharon's actions, his response was perceived in the region as a signal to Sharon that he could do whatever he wanted. Israelis will not negotiate under terrorist threat. Simple as that. And if the Palestinians are interested in a, a, a dialogue, then I strongly urge Mr. Arafat to put 100% effort into, into, into solving the terrorist activity, into stopping the terrorist activity. And I believe he can do a better job of doing that. And at that point, the Crown Prince sent a very powerful message to the president. It is obvious that you have decided to support Sharon, irrespective of what the consequences are to American policy or to your interests or to the interests of your friends. You're a sovereign country. You can do whatever you want. We are now in a position where we have to take actions that serve our interests without any regard to how they may affect your interests. And the letter to President Bush merely is a reflection of his character, of his willingness to challenge the United States. We can't take this anymore. We've had it up to here. Either you be more fair, more equitable in your dealings with the Arab world, or we will simply find a different arrangement than the one we are having with the United States. We can no longer have the same kind of relationship that we have had for the last 60 years. And within 24 hours, we had a response from the president to the Crown Prince in which the president laid out his vision for Middle East, two states, shared Jerusalem, just settlement of refugee issue, in very clear terms. And he said that we can only do that if we can stop the violence. 
Krampens responded to the president and said this is a positive step and you need to articulate this publicly. And the president agreed to do so two or three days before September 11. Oh my God, there it goes! Peace talks collapsed in the rubble of 9-11. Some Saudis say the attacks were welcomed. People received a message in their mobile phones. Congratulations. And then the next message in the mobile phone was uh, prayers to Bin Laden. They were very uh, jubilant and happy and looking at Bin Laden as a hero. People started killing sheep and killing uh, uh, camels and uh, uh, making big feasts and inviting their, their relatives and friends to celebrate the big event in America. There was a general shock, of course, um, disbelief. But there was a group of, uh, of people who said, OK, let them suffer now, let the Americans suffer. Let me put it this way. You know, I might hate someone's guts, OK, but I would not condone his murder. If by chance he was, you know, hit by a bus and, and, and you know, uh, and passed away, I wouldn't cry for him, you see? And this is the kind of feeling that took place in a segment of the society. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. Attention was quickly focused on Saudi Arabia as the heart of the problem. When it became clear that 15 of the 19 were Saudis, that was a disaster. A total disaster because bin laden at that moment had made in the minds of americans saudi arabia into an enemy a new u.s ambassador to saudi arabia robert jordan arrived in riyadh in october 2001 at the official level they were appalled uh, they were embarrassed uh, some of them frankly were in denial i remember meeting with one of the very most senior royals uh, a very well respected individual but he clearly was in denial. He said this had to have been a Zionist plot. Saudis are not like this, and Saudis by themselves, frankly, are not capable of launching a plot this sophisticated. People refused to accept that this was Saudis doing this. Imagine if you wake up one day, you have children, and find that one of your sons is a mass murderer. How gut-wrenching a discovery is that? America's war on terror would deeply divide Saudis. When Americans invaded Afghanistan, the government quietly allowed the U.S. to use Saudi air bases for command and control operations. Saudi militants captured in Afghanistan would make up the biggest segment of the prison population shipped to Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. The war in Iraq posed an even bigger challenge. Americans used Saudi air bases for bombing missions, but the government worried about the reactions of its people. I'll never forget being told by some members of the royal family, Mr. Ambassador, please don't win Iraq and lose Saudi Arabia. And they were that concerned. I think they meant that there was a great possibility that if they supported us in the way we needed, it would uh, further alienate the arch conservatives and the Islamist extremists uh, from the royal family and from the government, that it could destabilize the regime. And people were extremely worried that after Iraq is finished and done with, the United States would turn its head and start targeting countries like Saudi Arabia, like Syria, like. Uh, Egypt, Iran. Baghdad fell in a matter of weeks. Just days later, U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld arrived in Riyadh to announce U.S. troops were finally pulling out of Saudi Arabia. And they'll leave with us grateful for the support and cooperation that uh, uh, the kingdom provided. 
جاء أصل الكفر يغزو دارنا من صليب الغدر والكل أصم جاء أصل الكفر يغزو دارنا من صليب الغدر والكل أصم جاء أصل الكفر يغزو دارنا من صليب الغدر The American troop presence in Saudi Arabia had been a rallying cry for Al Qaeda. Now the American air base stands empty, but it didn't seem to matter to Bin Laden. Two weeks later, on May 12, 2003, Al Qaeda militants attacked three compounds in Riyadh, housing hundreds of foreign workers. 35 people were killed, including nine Americans. Over a hundred were wounded. This was something new. The attack grabbed Saudi's attention in a way that 9-11 did not. The next day, Colin Powell and I visited the Crown Prince, and he was white as a ghost, and absolutely shaken to his core by what had happened. And to the extent they had been in denial about the terrorist threat in the kingdom, that denial ended on the morning of May the 13th. We have to face the fact that these people who attacked and bombed in Riyadh are Saudis, our, our youth, our sons and, and, and brothers. They are not expatriates. They are not CIA here. They are not Zionists. They are our own people. But the bombing was really the major event that changed people, no doubt. Clear the air. We can't trust Al Qaeda. We can't trust the radicals. We can't trust the, uh, those extremists. Some members of the Saudi elite looked inward. They began to reevaluate the long-time deal under which the religious schools and universities were controlled by Wahhabi fundamentalists. I think the whole culture of education in Saudi Arabia um, uh, gave people dangerous tools, tools to teach people how to hate, uh, tools of hatred, tools of um, uh, uh, anger, uh, not tools of, of uh, understanding the reality of the world. In an unprecedented act of self-examination, Tash Matash, Saudi Arabia's most popular TV comedy show was allowed to air a bold sketch about extremist teachers instructing students how to hate non-Wahhabis. A moderate teacher decides to complain to the authorities at the Ministry of Education. When he gets there, he finds the teachers he's come to complain about in charge. The government has even moved against some of the most radical preachers. At the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, which oversees the country's government-owned mosques, they have begun firing some imams. There was a small group of imams that went too far, and they would not compromise. And that's why they've been dismissed from their duties. The total number of imams and preachers dismissed was about 1,300. Some hold extremist ideas against others, against the interests of the country and of Islamic work. But independent Wahhabi fundamentalists have fought back. A new privately owned Saudi TV channel, Al Majd, is dedicated to propagating their views. Even on a daytime kids' show, the message is often harsh and unambiguous. <laughs>
وفى ذئب وما وفت اليهود أبي أبلغ ترى الأقصى سلامي وقلنا مات لو قتل الشهيد أبي أخبره عن أشلاء شعب توثب عن محاربه يذود ما شاء الله تبارك الله والتحيك المعتاد ها 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 Clerics also want to roll back curriculum reform. Allow me to be direct. Did we ever interfere in the American curriculum, which unfortunately includes clear hostility to Muslims, Muslim nations, and specifically to the kingdom? Did we ever interfere in their social affairs, even though American social affairs have major flaws and need to be corrected? We opposed the change in the curriculum because America was interfering in our religion, in our faith, and in our unique character. America is aiming to make Muslims fall in love with and embrace American culture. American culture, conservative clerics believe, continues to raise expectations for women. This book, called Defending Virtue, was written by a cleric on the Council of the Ulama. Man is physically perfect and has natural power, it reads. The female is inferior physically, mentally, and emotionally. This is a book written by one of the greatest scholars. It was written to protect women. We consider the book in general as wonderful and deep. I just couldn't believe that this is something that has been taught, taught at uh, university. I felt it very humiliating. I was angry at the university as well. Yeah, the university. How could they allow such a book, uh, such a way of, comp of, of competition to, to be... Uh, uh, run at the university. What, what type of university is this? And this is the biggest university in the country. Who are these women? What is their educational level? Probably they have been influenced by Western theories or by a culture far removed from Islam. Their judgment does not count. I have this theory that these type of interpretations usually emerge and uh, get fortified in a society where men are very weak very um, backward and don't have any kind of power over anything. I am surprised that the majority of people discussing the issue of women are non-Muslims from the West. This is not an issue here. Not only do women in Muslim countries not complain about their situation, but more importantly, nor do Muslim men who correctly follow Islam. We don't have a problem. I do not know of any religion that has honored women as Islam does. The royal family continues to resist any real efforts at structural change. In early 2004, a prominent group of citizens petitioned the family for constitutional reform. The Minister of the Interior summoned them in. The Minister of Interior was uh, very upset and said, you know, uh, you, know uh, you should not have meetings and you should not have congregations and uh, uh, we are not going to, uh, I think, condone the whole concept of uh, reformation the way you think uh, it should be. We are doing it the way we think it should be done and it's not really reformation as in uh, uh, fixing things, it's, it's reformation as in uh, natural evolution. There's nothing wrong to be fixed. Shortly afterwards, a dozen reformers were arrested. Three are still in jail today. The continuing war in Iraq has only helped strengthen anti-American radicals in Saudi Arabia. During the holy month of Ramadan, as the U.S. advanced into Fallujah, senior Saudi clerics issued renewed calls for jihad against America. The truth is that the jihad that is in Fallujah is to raise the head. أن يحيي الجهاد 
والتضحية والمقاومة في العراق ضد المحتلين ونحن نقنت عليهم كل ليل وكل سجدة أن الله يبيدهم وأن يمزقهم وأن ينصرنا عليهم An unknown number of Saudis have traveled to Iraq to join the fight. The suicide bomber who killed 22 U.S. soldiers in Mosul last December was a young Saudi medical student. Back inside Saudi Arabia, the chronology of violence is relentless. And for Saudi Arabia, unprecedented. Since the Riyadh bombing in May of 2003, over 100 people have been killed by Al-Qaeda in attacks on compounds and oil companies across the country. Westerners remain the prime target. Most recently, a BBC cameraman was gunned down while filming in a Riyadh street last summer. Two days later, a U.S. defense contractor was shot to death in his garage. And a week after that, another U.S. defense contractor was killed outside his home in Riyadh. And U.S. engineer Paul Johnson was abducted by terrorists manning a fake security checkpoint. A video of his beheading was put out on the internet. In December, an all-out assault on the U.S. consulate in Jeddah left five foreign staff dead. The Saudi Ministry of the Interior in Riyadh was car-bombed two weeks later. Today, thousands of Americans are pulling out of the kingdom. British Airways has announced it is suspending all its flights into Saudi Arabia. The royal family is facing the most severe challenge in its history, straining its 60-year-old oil-for-security deal with America. We have enormous disagreements with them, but we have a fundamental common interest in going forward, even though our cultures are diametrically opposed in many ways to each other. Uh, and we're learning more about each other, and in many cases, neither side likes what they see. And so we've got to find ways to work on the common interests uh, and to help the Saudis through a period of coming into the 21st century. And they are dealing with this in fits and starts, and it's not always going to be pretty. One of the challenges for America is we're so unpopular over there right now with the people that the more we publicly praise or encourage what goes on, the more that could be the kiss of death. Ultimately, the Saudis believe an oil-dependent America cannot afford Saudi Arabia's demise. The House of Saud believes it will survive. This government has shown versatility and permanence. We have faced many problems. When oil came in the 50s, they said this country cannot survive because the wealth will, uh, will change the, the underpinnings of the government. But it's here. In the 60s, when they were calling Nasser the wave of the future, Nasser went away and the government is still here. After the liberation of Kuwait, saying that hundreds of thousands of American troops existing in Saudi Arabia would surely mean the death knell of uh, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. It is still here. They are a successful ruling family. They are very, very good at hanging on to power and should not be underrated in their cleverness, in their ruthlessness, um, uh, and in their sheer ability to, to hang on. explore at our website where you'll find a chronology of the kingdom's history including key events in the u.s saudi relationship a family tree profiling recent al saud kings 
analysis on Saudi Islamism and the prospects for reform, plus interviews with members of the monarchy, Saudi historians, activists, and religious leaders, and a chance to join the discussion at pbs.org. Next time on Frontline, after September 11th, he saw the responsibility and an opportunity. Before the war in Afghanistan, Rumsfeld wanted to build a smaller, nimbler military. Before the war in Iraq, he came in determined to reassert civilian control. There was another war. Winning a war does not mean victory. We won all the battles in Vietnam and we lost the war. Rumsfeld's War. Watch Frontline. To order Frontline's House of Saud on video cassette or DVD, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 Play PBS. Provided by the Stratford Foundation. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you.